Hello, welcome to Spotlight, a world of art laid out in bright relief. Spotlight, brought to you by the Isle of Man Arts Council. This evening, art is good for you. We check out the island's newest gallery. Following the recent unveiling of a magnificent new piece of public art at the airport, we speak to its creator. And the second part of our chat with author Chris Ewan as his latest thriller hits the shelves. Remember, do get in touch with any creative artistic endeavours you may be involved in, planning, hoping to create, working on, or would really like to put in that spotlight. Poetic, visual, theatrical, musical, art, galleries, mosaics, mime. Email spotlight at manxradio.com or me directly, Howard Kane at manxradio.com. They both come to the same place and they're all red. So, have you heard of pink seaweed? It is a thing, a real seaweed that is. Also, though, the catchy name of the island's latest art gallery up in Ramsey, which is set to open with its first exhibition around the end of the month or thereabouts. To find out more, I headed north to meet the appropriately pink-haired and cheerful owner. Hi! I'm Leanne Higgins and we've just opened Pink Seaweed Gallery in Ramsey. Well, technically we're not open yet, but we will be. (laughs) And we're actually standing in Pink Seaweed Gallery as we speak, surrounded by art. As you say, it is a work in progress getting there. So tell us a little bit more about it. What was the concept? How did you first start out on the idea of opening the gallery? So as an artist myself, I've always like wanted to have a space where... You can view all different types of art and you don't have to be professional. You hear so many artists say, oh, I'm not professional, I'm not really an artist, I just do it for fun or I just do it for therapy. Um, and yeah, it's just something that I've always wanted to do really, but it's just having having the time. We've got four kids um, and having a good space. Like when this shop came available, it just seemed like the perfect fit. It's a lovely part of town. It's surrounded by gorgeous shops, so yeah. And also, I got made redundant from my proper job, the proper job that paid the bills for 20 years. <laughs> so thankfully, I got a bit of a redundancy pay, which meant that it helped me with the setup costs and stuff like that. You could take the plunge. So I could take the plunge, yeah, and do something, well, live the dream, really. And it is, like you say, it's a great space, because any, any sort of gallery space like this, you need... A- good light as well and it's nicely done you've obviously got the shop front the light coming in and then again you've actually got nice down lighters in the ceiling already fitted here so that actually makes it a nice light yeah. airy space for people or for you to be able to display the art to best advantage yep definitely yeah it's really nice and bright we've put some new floor down just to bring in some more light and yeah it's really good lots of good comments so far so we're looking around now actually we're just looking at some of the pictures here before we just paddle over here and some are you going to be concentrating so then on purely local artists for this exhibition yes but going forward not necessarily it's just like artisans anybody that makes something that's a bit unusual and that you kind of have a connection with proper artisan people i've met and opening up then you said for the first exhibition is that going to be themed or just a no, collection or how is it going to work theme. so we called the exhibition um art is good for you so the brief was like wide open basically show show us what you've got show us what you're good at what makes you happy um so that's i think that's probably why we've got such a a vast array of different mediums different styles different colors And it is amazing because just as we're standing here and there's art in front of us of various sizes right the way down from gorgeous plate, some uh, ceramic work there, a piece I recognise from I think an exhibition or something very similar. I never quite took, well it's mixed media I suppose you'd call it, out of fabrics and it looks remarkable like um, a sea anemone or a... It's felted, so this is Rachel Roberts and she makes gorgeous felt things, she makes brooches, she makes these gorgeous jellyfish and these are all hand felted. And she's popped these lovely shells that she's found on the beach. They're terrific, just aren't they? Beautiful. Just the colours, and you can sort of, I don't know, you can see it hanging anywhere, really. They're great yeah, fun and just gorgeous. waving I've, in, I've in the breeze. I've got a little one at home in my kitchen. It's probably not the best place. It's got a bit dusty. <laughs> that's the problem, isn't it? And what about this plate down here? This is gorgeous with the... Uh... Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? So that's a lady called Jill Holiday. Um, and she's, yeah, she's put a few ceramic pieces in. Um... Yeah, they're just gorgeous. I love the colours. There's quite quite a lot of teal 
Yes, it is very nice indeed. Next door one, which caught my eye when I came in, which is a fantastic snake on a sort of black background. And it's it's almost got a sort of a three-dimensional feel to it. Yeah, it's gorgeous, isn't it? It's like a photograph. That's Chrissy. Um, she's done she's done free paints for it, actually. So we've got this snake and there's a parrot and a raccoon, I think. Mm. And they're just so realistic. It's like she's literally pasted a photograph onto the canvas. They're just beautiful. And it is amazing, as you say, and you can just get a feel from, from the stuff around us now. The amount of work that goes on and the number of artists we've got just here on the island working in, well, you name it, name the medium, and there'll be someone working in it. You were just showing me a piece over there, which I thought was like in ceramics and it's tile. It's actually beeswax. Yeah, it's mad. There's just so much. And I think people... There's this thing, you know, imposter syndrome. You wouldn't believe how many people have kind of tentatively walked in and... I don't know, maybe not displayed their work before because they didn't think it was good enough or they don't think they're a real artist. But honestly, like, I think that's basically what this is about. It's just come and have a go. If you, if you make something and you're proud of it, then let other people see it. Because art makes other people happy, not just whoever made it. And tell us a little bit about the name, because Pink Seaweed, a great name. Oh, Pink Seaweed. So actually, originally the gallery was going to be called Myrtle's Folly, which was my favourite flower. It's a dahlia. Um, but my stepson um, wanted to do a picture for the gallery because he was he's so excited about it so he, he bought me this picture and it was an underwater scene and he said look I've put some pink seaweed on there because I remember that story that you told me about pink seaweed so when I was like five um, there was a supply teacher at school and we'd been asked to draw like a beach scene mm -hmm. or whatever um, and I put some pink seaweed on there because I lived around the corner from the beach we were there practically every single day um, and yeah, she was like, why have you done it pink? There's no such thing as pink seaweed. It's brown or green. And I, I mean, I was good at school. I promise I was so good. And I was like, well, no, there is. I, I know there is because I see it every day and argued back. And yeah, I got put in the black square, probably for the only time in my entire life that I got into trouble at school. And I remember telling my mom and she was so mad. She was like, even if there is no such thing as pink seaweed, you, you're a little girl, it doesn't matter. So the fact that Teague reminded me of that, I just thought, you know, that's it, that's, it, that's the one. And it's a great name because, it, again, it's, it's got a lovely visual thought and it sticks oh, in the mind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so many people have sent me photographs of pink seaweed and the some in the Manx Museum on display. And also, we've got a marine biologist, oh. Laura. Yes, um, and she's going to put some first stuff in and I've asked her to please write me a little note that says there is definitely such thing as pink seaweed so I can frame it Stick and it have on. it on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So great space. You're working on it now. So working towards, um, have you got a sort of fixed time for the opening exhibition then sort of back end of August, September time? I think realistically it's going to be September because I just want to make sure that everything's hung nicely and that we get the most out of the space for the artists really just to make sure that their stuff's nicely displayed um we'll probably do a private show for the artists because i love the idea of everybody just getting together and chatting to each other and like sharing experiences and things like that and uh, so we'll probably do that first august maybe but we'll see probably. we'll just see how we get on and it's terrific to have another space because we've been doing a little mini series on spotlight here because again you speak to artists on the Isle of, Man, Isle of Man and they quite often bemoan the fact there's not that many spaces to get their work seen. Yeah yeah exactly. I love the idea of people that have never exhibited, not just people that haven't exhibited before because obviously we've you know we've got people here that have been exhibiting for a long time but for the people that have a bit of imposter syndrome just walking past and going I think I'm gonna go in there and ask her to put my stuff on the wall like I just think that's that's just great. And we're just going to let everybody have a go. If you're brave enough, then let's see what you've got. Great to uh, have a little walk around today. Lovely spot. I think it's going to be terrific. Uh, so best of luck and we'll, uh, we'll talk again. Thank you. It's a lovely little spot in the middle of Parliament Street. Lots of interesting art on display from a whole host of artists. And will be a much needed added space for the island's artists to display their rich and wonderful wares. Call in and say hello if you're up in Ramsey. Leanne says she's normally there Mondays, Tuesdays and Fridays, I believe. Just paddle in and say hello. Or you can find her on their Facebook or Instagram. Spotlight. Brought to you by the Isle of Man Arts Council. 
Now, we heard a little from author Chris Ewan last week. The former island resident was here to launch his latest thriller, The House Hunt, following in the line of highly successful crime thrillers, some of which may yet breathe not a word of it abroad, make it to the screen. Stay tuned to hear more on that. But first, I asked Chris about how he achieves his trademark reality style, which makes his stories so compelling for his legions of fans. What I'm looking for is situations that all of us in our everyday lives put ourselves in without necessarily thinking they could turn bad. So the previous CM Young book that I wrote was called The Interview, which is about somebody going for something as simple as a job interview and then finding themselves on their own with the job interviewer locked on the 13th floor of a building just as the weekend begins. So it's trying to find those moments where you or I might think, I could actually see myself ending up in that situation, but obviously then pushing it to become more of a popcorn thriller kind of vibe. And what is it you think about the thriller which remains and the sort of crime stories, thrillers? They are perpetually, it seems to me, popular. You know, a good written book like that is always popular. People always love them and they seem to always have loved them for the last century or more, I guess. What is it you think of that genre which brings people to them? There's so much, isn't there? I mean, for me, it's just a really banging story well told. You know, that page turning fiction. Sometimes you really just want to be absorbed by a story sitting hopefully by a swimming pool on holiday and you just have that really intense experience of one or two days where you're completely lost in a book and the action's so furious and there's so many twists and turns that you can't put it down um but also in the kind of thrillers i write i think there is that element of thinking about how you might react to a given situation it's almost like a safety mechanism i think that you put yourself in these different situations and you think would i behave in this way would i behave differently could i um, think my way out of this situation better than the character that's in the book and of course then there's always generally the sense that things are wrapped up very neatly in a crime novel or a thriller novel um, which gives you the sense of closure which you don't necessarily get in real life Were you inspired by any of the, uh, the great writers before you, before you sort of got started your own career? Oh very much so yeah, my, my big crime writing hero was Raymond Chandler and reading his uh, books was what made me want to become a crime writer uh, but after that, all of the kind of contemporary big name for writers that uh, uh, everyone reads are huge inspirations to me. Um, I'm a huge fan of Harlan Coben's work, who also works in this kind of everyday situation kind of domain. Uh, Lee Child, I'm a big fan of. Uh, I've just read a, a book by Riley Sagar, The House Across the Lake, which did that exact thing I was talking about, absorbed me completely for two days, didn't see the twist coming, absolutely loved it. And did you know from day one that, that you know, this was the genre for you? Did you ever, before you started taking up writing professionally, f- sort of flirt with other types of genre thing? Actually, no, this is, this is what I need to be doing. I, it took me a long time to realise this is what I should be writing. So when I started out my first book, I suppose loosely could be called literary fiction. Uh, and it landed me a literary agent, but it didn't get me a publishing deal. And then I, mo- I wrote two more sort of mainstream books. Uh, and in all that time... I was reading crime fiction and thriller fiction and it took me far too long to wake up to the idea that I should really be writing what I'm loving reading uh, until eventually I wrote my first book, The Good Thief's Guide to Amsterdam and everything sort of developed from there. And I believe that one uh, I was reading, I think, just beforehand, has that been taken up to The the Good Thief's Guide? Has that been taken up by an American TV company, did I see? Uh, Yeah, I can't say too much about it, but no, it is. It is an active development. Uh, it's at a very exciting stage wow. and all the pieces are there, but you never, no. of course, know if you're going to get over that that final step. And so I live in hope it might find its way to the screen. I'm, I'm very lucky. It's a, it's a fantastic team behind the adaptation. Uh, there's great people attached to it. But as ever, it's out of my hands. So yeah. And do, nice. do you have much of a say as the author? Do you have much of a say, do you say, with the adaptation or once you've sort of agreed a deal, can they go any which way with it it's a bit of a mixed bag really so really where you have a say is before they come to you when they when you're starting negotiations to get a sense of what they would do with your books and what kind of adaptation they'd make and what is their track record and if you feel that all those things are looking positive you're very much in their hands and I've been lucky with all the adaptations that have been carried out my books over the years I get sent draft scripts and I get asked for my views but really they don't need to take my views I mean these are the these are the experts they're much more suited to knowing what would work on tv or not and and I'm really alive to the fact that every book changes quite dramatically in Mm. the process of an adaptation and so I'm quite happy to sit back once I know that there's good people involved. And a reminder again, The House Hunt officially released on Thursday, the 31st of August.
Finally this week, if you've been down to the airport recently, you'll have seen the splendid new artwork there entitled Interdependence. It's a gorgeous, multifaceted mosaic of one of the iconic species of Manx waters, the enormous basking shark, a gentle giant of the seas and symbol of the fragility of our natural environment and how anything from the largest to the smallest can and does influence everything else. I asked artist Kimmy McCarry how she'd come to be involved in creating this high-profile work. Well, I first became aware of Culture Van in, ab- well, not advertising, but they put out um, a thing on social media to say that they were giving out special grants for their 40th anniversary in celebration of that. And I just thought, hmm, I'm going to have a go at that. Um, and you have to fill in a lot of forms and obviously come up with a, a concept and um, so I did that, filled the form in, and then you send it off. And of course, at that stage, everything's hypothetical. So it was, you know, you don't know if you're going to get the grant. Um, so I had preliminary talks with the airport, but on the basis that, you know, I may not get the grant. Mm. But anyway, I was delighted when I did. And um, then I had to actually do it. <laughs> And that's the uh, that's the hard part, I suppose, isn't it? Actually doing it. it, it's, and you work in in as you say, it's in sort of like collage or mosaic, so it's all made up of thousands, tens of thousands, maybe I don't know, of tiny pieces. It is, yes. I, it, funnily enough, I've always been, as I said, been an artist, and I've always worked with sort of play collage, in fact. And for me, this this is just an extension of collage. I did a lot of work that was published in uh, London with torn pieces of paper. Um, but I now work with glass and stone. And as I say, it's just really a, a progression. It's just an extension of the torn pieces of paper. Um, but I did study traditional mosaic in Ravenna in Italy, which is the centre for Byzantine mosaic. What's the attraction for you that we're working in mosaic? It's an ancient art form, I guess. I mean, people think about the the Romans doing it so beautifully. What what is it that draws you to it? Yeah, I I, I love the fact that it's a very ancient art form, but also the tactile feeling of it and the fact that um, you know the the placing of pieces. You can it, it just by altering one little piece, you can alter the whole look of a of a paint of a picture. I call it painting, but with 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 pieces of stone because a lot of mosaic I think has a bad name because it is literally sticking a bit of you know glass or whatever on a piece of wood and grouting it the way I do it is nothing like that it's called the double reverse method which was pioneered in Ravenna in Italy and the pieces are not grouted Um, and that's like the ancient Byzantine method whereby if you don't grout it, the light shines in on the mosaic at all different angles. So it's much more interesting and it is more full of life, if you like. A lot of mosaic can be very flat. Mm. And, you know, if it's practical for a tabletop, it's literally just flat and grouted and not very exciting. But um, this method is totally different and, in, well, in my opinion, is much more alive. I'm, I'm assuming it's relatively labour intensive, this sort of work. It's very labour intensive. <laughs> Some people have said, "Oh my God, your patience!" But I have, I've paid, I've got patience for that, but not for other things. But yeah, there are ten different processes involved in what I do, and um, each one is, you know, takes a lot of time. And I, I, I break each piece with the traditional mosaicist tools, which are called a hammer and hardy which is like a big double-ended hammerhead with a, a chisel, a big chisel head embedded in a piece of oak. And so each piece of, um, well, I, I use Venetian glass, which is called smalty, and each piece of that is broken by hand. And in this interdependence piece, I've used pool vash stone and scallop shells from Fenella Beach and stones from Castletown Beach and all sorts of bits off the beach and other things for the plankton because it's a a basking shark surrounded by plankton. Um, And the plankton are made up of all sorts of things, including valves from guitar amps and bottle tops and marbles and all sorts of things. Do you you think a lot about the nature and the island's relationship with its surrounding oceans and seas? Yes, I really do. Um, 
you know, the marine environment to me is very, very important. I'm not a marine biologist, but I, you know, I have done an awful lot of work based on life in the sea. And as you say, basking sharks are on the endangered list and plankton, and this is something that I wanted to draw attention to, are incredibly important in the whole ecosystem. You know, as a world, we can't live without plankton. If plankton go, then we go because they um, no plankton, no fish, no food for millions of people. And also they're responsible for up to half of the oxygen that we breathe. So they're vital for, for the ecosystem. And I just think that people need to be made aware of how important our oceans are and uh, we seem to be doing a pretty good job of ruining them sometimes so I just want people to if I can as I said I said um, at the unveiling if I can get even a handful of people to think more about the sea then I'll, I'll be happy and I'll have done a bit I'll have done something. Absolutely and I think it's a great way to do that I think it particularly public works of art like this where people see them every day i haven't had a chance to see it myself yet but i'm hoping to see it in the next week or so i have seen the pictures uh, as well and it looks absolutely stunning there's also a film people can go and see i think as well there is we made an accompanying film i was quite keen to do that because i wanted to have running alongside the artwork a piece that showed beautiful views of the island i've interviewed the marine biologist fiona gell and uh, peel fisherman and uh, a lovely um, manxman in Castletown who used to go out fishing and has known me since I was well since I was born really he used to know my grandfather Milray Cubbon is his name and he let me go and speak to him and we were just reminiscing about Castletown and the film encapsulates all that but it also has some amazing underwater footage of basking sharks which I accessed through the Manx Whale and Dolphin Watch but it was actually taken by Quentin de Backer. So it's really a it's a beautiful piece and it's had music specially written for it and my husband John Gallon put it together for me because he's he's an expert at doing that sort of thing. So you can access the film by the QR code which is um, next door to the piece at the airport and it's also on my website. Even I can get QR codes to work normally, which is really good. Was it important to have the local, as you are saying, Pool Vash just down the coast there, important to you to have that local connection? Definitely, yes. I wanted to. I spoke early on with Rosie Glassy from Pool Vash and she was very much on board and she let me rummage through their offcuts to use in the piece. And um, it's important. And I went, to, as I say, to Fenella Beach to get the scoll scallop shells and anything I find in, in Ma on the Manx beaches I've used. And yeah, of course, the Isle of Man's my home and it's in my bones and I wanted to give something back to the island that um, hopefully will make people look at it in a, in a you know, positive light and, and um, you know, realise how lucky we are to have the marine life we do have. How do you feel when you, you know, you're there at the unveiling and you actually see it there in its public domain and it's going to be there for forever and a day? Well, I, I'm, I'm very pleased with it because... Prior to the unveiling, I had, hadn't even seen it up on the wall at the airport because it was put up. It's all been a very long-winded process and it was put up and then obviously covered over because, um, you know, nobody is allowed to see it till the unveiling. But I didn't even see it. So when it was unveiled, I was very pleased with the outcome. And as, as you said, it's taken... I, this process started in January 22 um, so it's a year and however many months, six months or something. And just to see it all come to fruition is fantastic. And obviously I, I need to cut, thank Culture Vanin for, for giving me the um, grant in the first place. That's about it for this week. Don't forget, if you want to hear anything again, go to maxradio.com, download the Spotlight podcast, listen where and when you want. You can try it whilst whiling away the hours in between flights. See you next week when we might get all fungi and arty. More on that then. Until then, look after yourselves and whatever you're doing, be creative about it. Cheerio.